Welcome to the final lecture of this course. This week, we will focus on organizational theories, culture, and change. This lecture has been divided into three parts. In part one, we are going to examine a few organizational theories. Throughout the semester, we've learned about organizational behavior, people's actions in a social unit. Technically, an organization is a group of people who have common goals and who follow a set of standardized operating procedures in order to develop a product or a service. Organizations can be employers, nonprofit organizations, educational institutions like SIUE, or even groups of university students with similar interests. The success of an organization depends on its ability to integrate its various functions like production, finance, marketing, and HR in a strategic way, in a way that allows them to do better than their competitors and essentially make more money. Organizational theories, like the one we will learn about in this video, attempt to explain how individuals behave in organizations. We will briefly learn about four different types, the classic theory, the human relations theory, the contingency theories, and the systems theory. The first group of theories is known as the classics. These theories emphasized the architecture of organizations rather than the processes. Max Weber, a German theorist, developed some of the earliest classic organizational theories. He used four characteristics to measure and describe organizations. One, division of labor. We might pay attention to work specialization, or the degree to which tasks are subdivided into specific jobs. The various departments of an organization, human resources, accounting, public relations, all represent the division of labor. The assumption behind this model is that people are more satisfied and motivated when they specialize in a particular area. We might also pay attention to departmentalization, or how jobs are grouped together so that common tasks can be coordinated. Tasks can be grouped by function, commerce, defense, education, energy, by product or service, health, electronics, clothing, by geography or territory, by process, assembling, shipping, selling, or by customer. Two, delegation of authority. The chain of command is an unbroken line of authority that extends from the top of an organization to the lowest possible level. The purpose of this chain of command is to clarify who reports to whom. Three, structure. An organizational structure defines how job tasks are divided, grouped, and coordinated. Centralization is the degree to which decision-making authority is concentrated at a single point in the organization. In centralized structures, top-level managers make all the decisions and low-level managers implement them. This minimizes risk by limiting the number of people who make decisions and who have input in those decisions. In decentralized structures, managers who know more about the situation make and implement decisions. This enables the organization to be more flexible and respond quickly to changes in the environment. Four, span of control. Span of control describes the width of an organization. It reflects the number of employees that a single manager can efficiently and effectively direct. 
Understanding the span of control is important because it determines the number of levels and managers an organization needs. In this figure, you can see on the left an example of a narrow or a small span where each manager directs no more than two to three people. On the right, you can see an example of a wide span or a large span where some managers are directing five, six, seven employees. One last note about classic organizational theories. They tend to assume that there is one best configuration for optimal success. And that configuration is usually a bureaucracy, which is a type of organizational structure that includes a formal hierarchy, a strict division of labor, and a clear set of operating procedures. In our society, the term bureaucracy does not have a positive connotation. Here, we're using it to refer to the type of structure. We're not making a judgment about that structure. Technically, SIUE is a bureaucracy. We have a formal chain of command. I have a boss. My boss has a boss. Work has been divided, and each department specializes in a certain area, and there are very clear instructions for how to do our work. These theories also assumed that organizations affected the behavior of their members, but they failed to recognize that members also affect the organization. Remember, these were the earliest theories. The others that we're going to learn about now were built on the foundation of classic organizational theory. The next category of organizational theories is the human relations models. They are unique from a historical perspective in that they were the first to add a more human element to the study of organizations. Let's take a look at McGregor's Theory X and Theory Y. This particular model highlighted the impact that managers' attitudes can have on their subordinates. Managers who believe that their direct report's behavior needs to be controlled are said to have a Theory X mindset. This is the traditional do what I say mentality. Although Theory X managers may get things accomplished, they're probably doing so at the expense of their employees' well-being. Most people prefer to work for managers who believe their employees are active, responsible, and capable of self-regulation, those who have a Theory Y mindset. This is more in line with the modern paradigm of treat others how you want to be treated. As you know from taking this class, work outcomes tend to be higher or better when we take a Theory Y approach to managing people. In the 1940s, Argyris proposed another human relations theory, a growth perspective that suggests people develop from immaturity to maturity within their organizations, and they do so through a series of stages. Their development within the organization can be enhanced or stunted by what the organization does. When they develop, they move from dependent to independent, from passive to active, from someone with few abilities to someone with many abilities. They develop their shallow interests into deep, strong, meaningful interests. Their short-term perspective broadens and becomes a long-term perspective. They move from being followers to being leaders. Finally, they learn to be more self-aware and have more control over their actions. Now remember, this theory was proposed in the 1940s. At that time, it was revolutionary. Today, we are fully aware that work outcomes tend to be better when organizations invest in their employees' development. 
The contingency theories make up the third category. They're all based on the notion that the environment shapes organizations, that their qualities are contingent upon the qualities of the situation in which they operate. For example, Woodward suggested that an organization's span of control is dependent on its production. They proposed three types of organizations. Small batch organizations produce specialty products one at a time. Think of an Etsy shop or an artist who can only paint one unique painting at a time. Large batch or mass production organizations create large numbers of discrete units at a single point in time. Think of technology that has been produced in generations. The iPhone 11, for example, was produced as a large batch. Then the iPhone 12 was produced as another large batch. And the iPhone 13, 14, 15 will each be additional large batches. Continuous process organizations also create large numbers of units, but they do so continuously and without making major changes between batches. Think of the food you buy at the grocery store. Different types of organizations will then affect people and be affected by people differently based on their production strategy. Another contingency theory is Lawrence and Lorsch's model from the 1960s. They highlighted the impact of uncertainty and the rate of change on organizations' qualities. They proposed two different types of organizations. Mechanistic organizations are highly specialized and departmentalized. They have clear chains of command and rely on formal rules to operate. They tend to have smaller, narrower spans of control and decisions are typically centralized and made by top leaders. Organic organizations, on the other hand, rely on cross-functional and cross-hierarchical teams to get the work done. They encourage a free flow of information and tend to have larger spans of control. Decision-making is decentralized and managers give more power to their direct reports to participate in the decision-making process. This model is yet another way of thinking about the differences between organizations and how their architecture impacts individual people. In the late 1980s, Mintzberg proposed another contingency theory. This figure illustrates their ideas about the different parts of an organization. At the top, the organization's ideology, its mission, vision, values, drives everything its members do. At the bottom, the organization's operating core does the hard work of creating the products or delivering the services. The middle line includes management and leadership, the structure of technology, and not just electronics, as well as support staff, shown on the left and right of the figure, should strengthen everything the operating core, the managers, and the leaders are doing. Finally, the strategic apex toward the top includes top leaders and managers, as well as the organization's strategic plan for how to coordinate all of its parts. Mintzberg also proposed six different types of coordination, shown here in this figure. First, Members of the operating core can coordinate their efforts with each other using informal communication and without involving supervisors. The second option is direct supervision of the operating core. Third, the standardization of work processes means the techno structure has a direct impact on how various groups within the operating core do their jobs. Fourth, the standardization of outputs means the techno structure has a direct impact on the output instead of the processes used produced by each group in the operating core. Fifth, 
the standardization of KSAOs necessary for production means that the operating core receives extensive training related to their job. And sixth, the standardization of norms means that the members of the operating core share similar values, expectations, and beliefs. Based on these variables, Mintzberg proposed five types of organizations, each one shaped by how the work is coordinated and which part of the organization is primarily responsible for the coordination. This table includes each type, its primary coordinating effort from the previous slide, its primary component of the organization from two slides ago, its design qualities like centralization, and its commonly noted contextual factors. Simple structures rely on direct supervision and the strategic apex. Machine bureaucracies rely on standardized work processes and the techno structure. Professional bureaucracies, on the other hand, rely on standardized KSAOs and the operating core. Divisionalized forms rely on standardized outputs and the middle line. Adhocracies rely on mutual adjustments and the support staff. Missionary organizations, which were added years later, rely on the standardization of norms, of beliefs. Today, we know that Mintzberg framework fails to capture all of the different kinds of organizations that exist, but their work certainly highlights some of the many factors that we should consider when managing people and leading change. The final group of organizational theories that we will cover in this part of the lecture is the system theories. A system is an abstract term. It refers to an organized set of ideas, theories, models, and principles. Psychology, for example, is a system. SIU is a system, and SIUE is part of that system. The system's theories highlighted the need to consider both internal and external factors, and to consider how those factors interact, how the system affects its parts, and how its parts affect the system as a whole. In the figure here, we can see some examples of these factors government regulations, suppliers, trade agreements and tariffs, national culture, customers, industry standards, shareholders, competition. All of these things affect how the organization operates and how the individuals within the system behave. 